Hello and welcome to the New Republic Salon. This is a monthly series where we interview the authors of new books. Today we're joined by Hari Kunzru, whose new book is the novel Red Pill. Uh, we're going to hear two readings from the book. We're going to discuss the book and then we'll have some questions from the audience. Um, so this works kind of the same way as it would in, in real life, except that all the Q&A questions will be done through the chat box. Oh no, in fact, the Q&A box. If you look at the bottom of the screen, there's like a Q&A box. So if you are in the audience and you have a question for Hari that you want us to ask at the end, um, drop it in there and I'll pull them together and then I will select the best ones or maybe just all of them and ask him. Hari, thank you so much for coming on. It's great to see you here. Thanks for having me. Um, so do you want to just start us off by um, setting up the book a little and uh, going into your first reading? I mean, I, sp I suppose the simplest thing for me to do is to read from the very beginning. So um, I will do that and then and then maybe you give a little bit of context afterwards. And, and, and uh, um, do, you want, do you want me to read the, both the readings from the different places or, or uh, should we talk a bit and then do a second reading? I thought what we would do would be listen to the first part, talk about that, uh, and exhaust all topics of conversation okay. on that and then move on to the next one. All right, perfect. So um, the novel is called Red Pill and uh, I'm going to read you the opening section. I think it's possible to track the onset of middle age exactly. It's the moment when you examine your life and instead of a field of possibility opening out, an increase in scope, you have a sense of waking from sleep or being washed up on shore, newly conscious of your surroundings. So this is where I am, you say to yourself. This is what I've become. It's when you first understand that your condition, physically, intellectually, socially, financially, is not absolutely mutable. That what has already happened will, to a great extent, determine the rest of the story. What you've done cannot be undone. And much of what you've been putting off for later will never get done at all. In short, your time is a finite and dwindling resource. From this moment on, whatever you're doing, whatever joy or intensity or whirl of pleasure you may experience, you'll never shake the almost imperceptible sensation that you're traveling on a gentle downward slope into darkness. For me, this realization of mortality took place conventionally enough, beside my sleeping wife at home in our apartment in Brooklyn. As I lay awake, listening to her breathing, I knew that my strength and ingenuity had their limits. I could foresee a time when I would need to rest. How I'd got there was a source of amazement to me, the chain of events that had led me to that slightly overheated bedroom, to a woman who had things turned out differently I might never have met or recognized as the person I wanted to spend my life with. After five years of marriage, I was still in love with Ray, and she was still in love with me. All that was settled, a happy fact. Our three-year-old daughter was asleep in the next room. Our very happiness made me uneasy. It was a perverse reaction, I knew. I was like a miser fretting about his emo emotional hoard. Yet the mental rats running round my bedroom around my child's bedroom, had something real behind them. It was a time when the media was full of images of children hurt and displaced by war. I frequently found myself hunched over my laptop, my eyes welling with tears. I was distressed by what I saw, but also haunted by a more selfish question. If the world changed, would I be able to protect my family? Could I scale the fence with my little girl on my shoulders, would I be able to keep hold of my wife's hand as the rubber boat overturned? Our life together was fragile. One day, something would break. One of us would have an accident. One of us would fall sick, or else the world would slide further into war and chaos, engulfing us as it had so many other families. In most respects, I had little to complain about. I lived in one of the great cities of the world. Save for a few minor ailments, I was physically healthy. And I was loved, which protected me from some of the more destructive consequences of a so-called midlife crisis. I had friends who, without warning, embarked on absurd sexual affairs, or in one case developed a ruinous crack habit that he kept hidden from everyone until he was arrested at 3am in Elizabeth, New Jersey, smoking behind the wheel of his parked car. 
I was not about to fuck the nanny or gamble away our savings. But at the same time, I knew that something was profoundly but subtly wrong. There was some urgent question I had to answer that concerned me in isolation and couldn't be solved by waking Ray or going on the internet or padding barefoot into the bathroom and swallowing a sleeping pill. It concerned the foundation for things, beliefs I'd spent much of my life writing and thinking about, the various claims I made for myself in the world. And, coincidentally or not, it arrived at a time when I was about to go away. One reason I was awake, worrying about money and climate change and Macedonian border guards, was that an airport transfer was booked for five in the morning. I never sleep well on the night before I have to travel. I'm always nervous that I'll oversleep and miss my plane. Thank you for reading from that. Um, so I think it's fair to say uh, from that opening that bad things can be expected to happen in the rest of the book. Um, but I think that the kind of bad things that happen, on, you wouldn't know from that. You know, I think the, the, the novel begins, I would say, beginning of 2016. Uh, yeah. yeah that so be just kind of the beginning of that year when Trump will win the election at the end of the year and this whole new set of or well, not new set, but a whole set of uh, ideas and characters are going to come into the public eye and come into focus. And uh, the character at the beginning there is sort of feeling something coming on and not knowing what it's going to be. So, I mean, he's he's a writer like me, and um, but he he has a very particular sort of a project. He's quite a uh, he's a non-fiction writer who has, slightly to his surprise, had a successful book and been invited on this prestigious residency in Germany. And he, his project is rather, is, is, is a very sort of high-flown one. He wants to write a book about lyric poetry and the self. And, and, and he has this sort of wish to, it's almost like he has a wish to experience his own selfhood through doing this project. He wants to kind of luxuriate in, in, you know, thinking about these great German poets of the 18th and 19th century who, you know, were uh, so sort of in touch with their exquisite interiority. And he wants to be like that and to have that sort of experience. And instead, what happens to him when he gets to this residency is that his anxiety, this rather unfocused anxiety that he has about the state of the world, um, starts to sort of chip away at him. And the more he introspects, the more he um, tries to experience himself in the way one of these great poets experience themselves, he starts to suspect that there's nothing, there's no there there. There's no, he doesn't have an experience of himself as this uh, infinitely deep kind of well of, of, uh, of subjectivity. Right? He finds himself very fragmented and very sort of unavailable. And the, his troubles multiply. He's unable to write. He spends a lot of time binge watching a very violent uh, police show uh, on on a streaming service. I mean, he's basically he's he his kind of work avoidance turns into something rather more serious and rather more sinister. I mean, his his fragmentation becomes to to be a real sort of psychological problem. But I mean, what, what you said about about the kind of the you know the, the the coming of the of the the current presidency and so on is is really you know I mean Trump is a symptom rather than rather than a cause of anything like he doesn't you know he hasn't brought this into being he's a kind of effect of a of a set of much larger processes that I think we've we've been aware of coming down the pipe maybe for you know for a decade or or more there are um there's a sort of disaffection from the center of uh, you know the, the 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 sort of established political center and and uh and the sort of democratic settlement that made uh that that, that sort of persisted after the second world war i think is fragmenting in in a way the people didn't expect at the end of the cold war the sort of victorious moment in in the in the 90s of the end of history and all that kind of thing led people towards a sort of narrative whereby now politics ought to have been some sort of um rather technical managerial business you know it's a question of tweaking a little supply side economics here you know and, and just uh, just adjusting things but instead we've had a complete breakdown of consensus and and 
technology has has uh, eaten away at the foundation of things about not least of our, our sort of information ecology in a way that is uh, as it, you know people are scrambling to catch up with it and so on you know now we have people in power who are using this kind of collapse in order to further their own ends and 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 so I mean I, th I think we're in a a moment of of real crisis that goes beyond Trump or beyond mm. beyond one American administration. Right. So the book takes place in 2016, but when the narrator, it, it only ends with the, well, I don't want to say where it ends, actually. I'll let you do that if you want to. But um, when he goes to Germany, to this residency, he sort of steps into this intellectual world, but almost gives you a taxonomy of the intellectual currents that one might say have allowed for the rise of the alt-right or the far right in Germany or in the US and other European countries. Um, because he's sort of surrounded by liberals who are very insistent on uh, like transparency and collaboration that's very distasteful to him. And that you can kind of see like, these are like the people one might react against. And then there's this sort of dark web guy. And then he meets this group of very fringe people who are very, uh, kind of like adjacent to Ben Shapiro or Jordan Peterson, or I think some people have kind of identified one of the figures in the book as being a Steve Bannon type. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd say they're sort of considerably to the right of any of those figures, actually. But the, yeah, I mean, I mean, so so the the place he goes to on on the residency is this is this institute that's the a foundation set up by a German industrialist who has this kind of Habermasian notion of he's going to he's financed the sort of public sphere and everybody's supposed to be utterly transparent to each other and to to collaborate in producing this sort of rational discourse, which is as you say, it's this sort of liberal dream of a, of a sort of post-war. Uh, a discourse community or whatever um a public you know the public sphere in that in that sense and and our narrator is a is a grumpy disaffected rather spiky person who can't stand the idea of being you know he wanted to be in he wanted to be left alone he wanted to be on his own with his poets and and just sort of away from from the sort of need to present himself in any way so he kicks against that in a, in a rather sort of immature way and He's also not really taken into account the fact that he does have to kind of interact with the other fellows who are on this on this fellowship. And one of them is, as you say, is this is this guy Edgar, who is a, who is a chair of neurophilosophy. And and Edgar's it's not so much that Edgar is a sort of character of the dark web, but Ed, Edgar is a, is interested in in um, things that are measurable, and and he's rather suspicious. I think rightly suspicious of a lot of the a lot of the ways that the narrator sort of sees the world. I mean, he, in, in this kind of, you know, the narrator's trying to talk about our oh, poetry is this sort of technology for changing selfhood. And he uses all the sort of high flown, quite kind of theoretical language. And, 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 and Edgar sort of tells him bluntly that it's mostly, most of it is completely meaningless to him, that he's just a population of neurons and any, any sense that he has of a self is, is, is rather an illusion. I mean, I, I, I was reading, there's a very interesting German philosopher called Thomas Metzinger, who, who writes about how our sense of having a self and especially a self that controls things and um, like initiates action is, is, actually a, is actually a sort of illusion and the self is a sort of epiphenomenon and actually things are going on, uh, which we're more or less sort of, the self is a sort of passenger or observer. You know, I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, as soon as you, you, as soon as, as if you are somebody like me who, who kind of was 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 trained to think about uh, uh, about um, you know, within the terms of the of the humanities, once you collide that with a perspective that's coming out of neuroscience, there it gets hard to hold on to certain sorts of uh, sorts of things. But I think there are consequences to the sort of the sort of reduction of some of the illusions about selfhood the old-fashioned kind of cartesian ideas about selfhood that that are happening in in neuroscience for example i mean if you don't think there's such a thing as um you know a human subject what happens to human rights which attach to that subject you know you start unraveling you start pulling at a thread about 
uh, about certain things to do to do with with the dignity of the person and so on. And and you come away with what we're unraveling much more. And, and I think these are questions that we haven't really culturally fully addressed yet. And I quite liked putting my sort of grumpy, rather superior narrator in collision with with people who are actually don't care at all about his perspective in the world i mean later on as you say he he kind of falls into this milieu of of people from the sort of extreme right and um that's a rather different a different kind of encounter it's a kind of encounter with with people who don't even accept the basic terms and conditions of his politics the idea you know he, that racism is a bad thing or uh you know that so on and so forth so they're that's a that that's a challenge to him of a different kind and he is also very unsettled by that as well because i don't know part of the part of the book is about a kind of complacency that i have seen or have you know I've, about uh about explaining the world there's a kind of there has been a real i think kind of inability to to, to see how the the foundations for certain sort of, you know, mainstream liberal positions have rather, have rather eroded in recent years. And it's kind of, it was a, you know, I mean, not novels are not there to make uh, arguments per se. I mean, you know, novels, I, I mean, I think of a novel as a place where you kind of clear a space and let various, various things kind of rise up and, and interact and kind of, you know, clash with each other. So, for me, it's it's very, it, it, it's fun, apart from anything else, to, to kind of put all these these perspectives in there and 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 show how somebody who is in many ways quite complacent and quite kind of self-absorbed gets uh, unseated by some of the things that he encounters. Well, speaking of a space, it's interesting that all the characters are have come from America. They're not necessarily American, um, but. The novel is set in Germany, uh, and it's set in this very uh, haunted part of Berlin, opposite the the house where the fin the final solution was planned. Um, why did you feel like Germany was the place for this story? Well, I was I was thinking about privacy and selfhood and and surveillance and and that kind of thing. And then I, I mean, in in purity, it was a very it's a very banal explanation. You know, I, w I went on a fellowship in, in Berlin to the American Academy, which has this villa by the lake in Wannsee. And so I stole their location completely and put a very different institution in. I you know, want to emphasize the American Academy is a lovely place and, and nobody <laughs> spied on me. And, and uh, there was no enforced <laughs> and, uh, transparency. Nobody, yes. No, you didn't get a, kicked out, presumably. I also did not get kicked yeah. out. I did not have a breakdown. I did not get kicked <laughs> out. In fact, I was there with my family as well. So this whole kind of narrative of this guy who's gone away from his family is fiction. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, this Wannsee is a, is a, is a complete. I mean, it's a suburb of Germany, a suburb of Berlin. It's quite, it's quite a dull place in certain ways. I think you could you could say, but it's under that sort of placid suburban surface. There's quite a lot going on. I mean, firstly, it's you know it is well known as the site of this conference in 1942, where where the kind of practical details of the final solution to the Jewish question were were organised. I mean, I recently found out that that was a 90 minute meeting i imagined it was a i imagined it was a very involved and in kind of detailed thing but it was actually a it was a it was a, a meeting that was done with a lot of silences and a lot of it was about kind of getting buy-in from all the different departments anyway that's a that's an aside but vans is also known as a sort of summer place for berliners to go and so it has a it, you know in the summer it's a it's a it's a place where people go and swim and and boat and so on but in winter it's it's quite bleak and i mean i would take these wintry walks around the lake and i'd almost always end up at the grave of uh, heinrich von kleist the uh the writer the romantic writer who had died in a suicide pact with a, a woman called henrietta vogel um, and they almost sort of inevitably became kind of part of my experience of, of that place. You know, the people in their thirties who had decided to, they weren't in a romantic relationship and Kleist seems to have had this obsession with, with shooting himself and dying in a suicide pact. And he's a very kind of unsettled and, and, uh, um, unsettling sort of writer. And so my, in the novel, 
the narrator kind of gets mixed up with with uh, with Kleist and thinking about Kleist, and Kleist becomes a kind of rather uh, rather unwelcome spirit animal for the for the writer. Um, one of the things I was interested in about this center, the Deuter center that the narrator goes and stays at, is that it seems to be this sort of symbol for the idea that Germany had, has worked out the problems of its past. And there's a lot of talk in Germany about reckoning with the past, and recently there's a book, uh, Learning from the Germans, by Susan Neiman, that sort of claims that America should look to Germany because they've mm. figured out how to come to terms with the guilt of the Holocaust. Um, and it seems like the setting for this story is really in the center that's sort of claiming to have done that very directly because it's founded by this guy who was in the Wehrmacht uh, and then made a lot of money. And it seems it kind of clear that it hasn't. And the backdrop of the story is sort of um, how do you build a healthy society when you are claiming to have come to terms with things that you haven't? Yeah, I mean, you, the, the, the Germans have this idea for Gangenheitsbewältigung, coming to terms with the past, and and people like Adorno wrote about the need to have this full cultural reckoning, which the Germans have done, I think, very, you know, with a great deal of success, and um, and it is a contrast to the US. I mean, I mean, at the moment, there's a lot of conversation. I mean, with the books like Isabel Wilkerson's cast book just came out about and she tries to she shows how the uh Nazi Nuremberg race laws actually kind of borrowed a lot from southern US legislation from uh, Jim Crow legislation and that there hasn't I mean I think what we what, what's happening now all around us is a very very traumatic and rather big belated coming to terms with the past of a kind that Germany, the very painful things that Germany did in the 50s and 60s about acknowledging things that had happened in their recent past, America is having to do with reference to a, to a, more, a slightly more distant past. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me to see things like the Watchmen, the TV uh, drama, which has used the Tulsa, uh, um, the the i mean they call it a race riot which is just such a, an, an incorrect description but the 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 sort of uh, the the tulsa sort of mass pogrom of 1921 and other other facts like that are coming into our public discussion in a way that they weren't before i mean people are acknowledging the effects of things like redlining and various other forms of segregation that have gone you know long long past the you know the formal grant of of civil rights and so i think i think that's a that parallel is a good parallel but that process is never it's never done it's always an ongoing process it has to be part of the public conversation and a lot of people always find that uncomfortable i mean in in britain i'm you know, involved in a lot of conversations in britain about the legacy of empire and there is a strong kind of constituency around at the moment of people who want to say why are you making us feel ashamed all the time? I don't want to feel guilty all the time. I want to feel proud of my history. And 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 this kind of question of a sort of psychological state to, of of guilt or or shame or or uh, you know being made to feel bad is something that a lot of people on the right, in particular, push against. And and you know one to me very useful frame is to is to is to sort of maybe get outside that notion of you know of people having to feel personally guilty because actually it's quite to be quite honest one's feelings of guilt or innocence are, are, are beside the point in a way you want you what it, this is a public acknowledgement and and a, and a kind of public um you know certainly in american in american terms material things have to change rather than rather than you know it doesn't matter if you know a bunch of people feel bad because slavery um but this but the notion of 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 being made to feel guilty is 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 a kind of is is how people kind of are channeling a lot of a lot of this and and it's and it's a it's a hugely uh difficult area to 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 try and you know if you want to 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 people to acknowledge what actually happened 
and move forward you know getting beyond this kind of uh this kind of this kind of moment of personal psychological guilt is 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 i'm not sure i'm being very clear there but it's it's uh, but yeah i mean we're i mean it's i want to say it's beyond the us or, or germany it's kind of mm-hmm. it's a kind of uh I don't know, a kind of composition with relation to history that we're all kind of in at the moment. Germany seems like a very neat setting for it, though, because I think um, with the narrator, he worries about all the stuff that's going to happen. He phones his wife and says, I think we're, you know, in something like the last days of the Weimar Republic. And so for someone who's in Germany to say that, it's actually not as, as absurd sounding as it is for someone in America. Because there's a sense of it did happen here. Yeah, I mean, in, in you know, I mean, in in some senses, it also did happen in America, and that's part of the that's part mm-hmm. of the issue here is that there is a sort of um, part of the pain of the current moment is a uh, is a sort of tearing away of a self image of innocence. Right. I mean, you know, the, the I mean, the Germans, you, you, the Germans after after Nuremberg, it was not possible for Germans to maintain their national innocence, although many people of course kind of claim or like claim to be personally innocent of any involvement you know um uh but in you know i guess I mean, what we, i'm there... saying is it's a way uh, for the reader to feel oh guilt germany i i know this like, yeah i mean in germany also i mean the other part of german history that i got very involved is is is, is the the experience of the stasi in east germany and that kind of state surveillance which is very interesting to think about in terms of our current sort of conversation about surveillance and privacy, which is all, you know, it's all around the, 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 the spy in your pocket, your phone and, and, and being tracked and being kind of voluntarily giving up all sorts of information to tech companies, which, uh, you know, then narrows the space of, of freedom. I mean, it, it's interesting to me, this whole notion of, of how one behaves when one thinks one can is all, at least potentially being watched um, you know and that certainly i mean i personally find it very hard to, to to come to terms with being in these in houses where people have these smart speakers where you you know you say a word and suddenly they you know you've bought something on amazon mm-hmm. and uh you know the the idea that uh that my private conversations in a in a living room with my friends are at least potentially being eavesdropped on I, well, I, I find very difficult. A, at least one case where it has called the cops on the people in the house. Right. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, you get, you get literal. swatted because you make a bad joke. <laughs> yeah. Um, so before we go to the next reading, I, I want to ask about the title. Um, and maybe that links in well with this idea of being enmeshed in a world of technology anyway. So the title comes from the discourse around that has grown up around the film, The Matrix, this idea of being red pilled. Um, can you tell us what that is uh, and also sort of why you were drawn to it as the frame for the novel? Or I mean, yeah, so it's, 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 it's become quite kind of culturally familiar, the scene in The Matrix where the hero is offered a choice. Either he can see, he can take the red pill and he can see the world, the scales will fall from his eyes and he will see the world as it is in all its horror. And, and in that movie, the, the horror is pretty horrible. Everybody's kind of the raw material for this kind of alien machine uh or you can take the blue pill and maintain your uh you know your state of innocence or your state of illusion and and this the notion of the red pill became kind of popular you know partly through the sort of the men's rights internet but certainly it became a kind of a, a kind of way that people on the on the right and on the alt right the kind of internet enabled right uh that they would talk about uh converting people to their perspective i mean you know you, you hear this phrase are you red pilled on the jq are you red pilled on the jewish question do you believe that uh that you know there is a jewish conspiracy that kind of idea that there's you know there's the world that the mainstream you know media want you to believe but underneath that there's some world of occult truth or kind of you know secret knowledge that only you and your fellow uh, far right initiates actually no I mean it's a very attractive pitch in a way I mean it's a but it is it, I mean I'm you know I, I liked the idea of of putting a kind of an elite coastal liberal 
character into into a sort of frame of mind where he's having to take this seriously not necessarily like a kind of uh, crude conspiracy theory but to take seriously the notion that the, all the the kind of foundations for for his life and his perspective on the world his ethics and so on it, that could actually not all be true um and what you know what what do you do are you is it is it are certain sorts of perspective livable i mean as, as the book goes on his psychological state gets more fragile and he is you know the, the picture of the world that he develops becomes kind of positively apocalyptic um I mean, and and then there's a sort of recuperation at the end, but which I mean, people are amused about the ending. I mean, the ending is, you know, it is a kind of coming back to Brooklyn and 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 dealing with, you know, the a much more kind of nailed down public world, but with that sense that there's a hinterland there of 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 things that are not being dealt with by the the mainstream political discourse, and that's the sort of feeling I suppose I have had over the last few years of 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 gratitude i mean i part of this book comes out of the fact that i spend i spend too much time on the internet and and have always spent a certain amount of time on the far right internet which has been a, a sort of object of you know appalled fascination to me but also as a kind of early warning system i feel you should know you know know the people who who want to put you in a camp uh and i've watched this culture grow and 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 become you know, more powerful. And also I've, I've watched it. I've watched it. I've under, I can understand the, the pleasures and the, and the, the attraction of that culture, which I think is, you know, there's a perspective that isn't comfortable for, for a lot of people to, to think, but you know, there are the, the pleasures of hating are, are, are real ones. And especially now, that, that hatred can be channeled and weaponized by people who have particular agendas and the power to carry them out. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's important for us to, to make that part of the conversation. So the gateway drug in this novel, uh, the kind of bridge to that world of red pill people, um, people who are using facts and logic is not the internet, it's television. Um, so shall we hear your second reading? Sure. Sure. Um, so I mean the the narrator who isn't named is is uh he's he's failing to work and uh and instead of working he's he's spending his time binge watching kind of bad uh procedural TV uh and uh, and and the, the the show that he uh he gets involved gets very into is called Blue Lives so I'll I'll read a bit about about that plot is the artificial reduction of life's complexity and randomness. It's a way to give aesthetic form to reality. I went upstairs, lay down on my bed with my laptop open on my chest and carried on with blue lives. I'd been watching a lot of television drama in Berlin, often several hours a day, retreating from formlessness into soothingly tight plotting. In most ways, blue lives was an entirely unremarkable product. After a lifetime of American police shows, I probably wouldn't have devoted yet more hours to watching plainclothes cops brutalise people, let alone spent time on the internet, hate reading profiles of the mind behind the show, had its tone not been so weird, so off. On the surface, Blue Live seemed very conventional, but something else was at work, a subtext smuggled into the familiar procedural narrative. The show's cops were all members of a special unit and they'd lost their moral compass. They were now as bad as the criminals they were pursuing. Everyone, criminals and police, was in high stakes competition with everyone else, committing acts of appalling violence. When I started watching, the horror of this world had felt safely abstract, so removed from my own life that I could take pleasure in the melodramatic storyline. I'd become very involved with the characters, or if not exactly with the characters who were quite thinly drawn, then how they dealt with the extreme situations in which they found themselves, their strange combination of recklessness and calculation. They were forced to improvise and make instant decisions. It had to accept that even the tiniest mistake could be fatal. 
I reheated some takeout leftovers and ate them as another episode began to autoplay. I was bored, sick of the car chases and the shouting and the bad blues rock soundtrack and was beginning to wonder about switching to something else. The protagonist, Carson, was working a case with his partner, Pensky, knocking on doors in a project when they heard a violent domestic dispute. Bursting into an apartment, they found a black man and a white woman, both in their underwear, a woman with a visible wound above her eye. Carson, full of chivalrous outrage, pistol-whipped the abuser, a spontaneous outburst that turned into a bloody and protracted scene. As the man screamed and begged for Carson's mercy, Petsky took a look around. In a cupboard, he found a suitcase with a lot of money, banded up drug dealer style in thousand dollar rolls. The two cops looked at the suitcase, then at each other. They made a judgment. This is your lucky day, they told the beaten, disfigured man. They took the money and left. Their victory soon turned sour. Two days later, the woman who'd been at the apartment was found strangled to death in an empty shipping container. It seemed likely that the drug dealer boyfriend was responsible. Feeling angry and guilty, Carson and Pensky searched obsessively, kicking down the doors of shooting galleries and crack houses. When they found the boyfriend, they took him to an abandoned factory and tied him to a chair. As Carson tortured the man with an electric drill, his face was framed tightly by the camera, a haunted grimace soundtracked by appalling screaming. Usually I could watch dramatised violence, even convincingly shot and acted, without feeling much beyond a sort of defensive boredom and a mild interest in the plot. But something about this was different. I felt, there's no other way to put it, at risk, as if I were present in the room and there would be consequences for watching. It seemed to me that unless I did something to prevent the torture, I would be mentally and spiritually violated by it by its imprint, its presence in my memory. Carson forced open the boyfriend's bloodied mouth and pushed the drill between his teeth. Although nothing was shown beyond a few impressionistic frames, it was terrible to watch. And somehow I'd forgotten that these were not real events and I had only to press the space bar on my laptop to pause them. Carson, whose face was now spattered with blood, looked directly into the camera and spoke. The whole earth, he said, perpetually steeped in blood, is nothing but a vast altar on which all living things must be sacrificed without end, without restraint, without pause until the consummation of things. Then he went back to his grisly work. The effect was strange and upsetting, doubly so because the line was entirely out of keeping with the rest of the show. Usually the actors never acknowledged the audience and Carson's dialogue consisted of grunts and threats. Sacrificed without end, he said, and his eyes filled with sorrow. It was a different sorrow to mine, the sorrow of the accomplice who fears that watching will carry an unforeseen moral cost. Nor was it the sorrow of the victim, whose screams formed the soundtrack to the image of Carson's face. It was the executioner's sorrow, the disappointment of a man who's been initiated into the great mystery of human suffering only to find out that it is just a puerile joke. Thank you. Um, one, one note before we uh, keep talking more is for anyone in the audience, this would be a great time to throw a question in the Q and A. Um, it's at the bottom of the screen. Um, so blue lives is, uh, both recognizable and ugly, <laughs> bizarre, warped, show and i i imagine since you wrote this because it takes a long time for a book to actually be written and come out um it, in the time since you wrote it there's been so much criticism of the way that stories about policing dramas cop shows are told and i wondered how and, and it, clearly you wrote this before even before that how the idea for this show came to you um well, I'm, I mean, I suppose the, um, the, I mean, the origin might be in something that Michael Haneke, the film director said that I was very struck by, which is that he, he you know, he was asked, you know, he's, he's made various films like Funny Games, which are almost unbearable to watch these. He made, he, 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 he produces these scenes of, of, I mean, not just, not just sort of violence, but of extreme discomfort. And he does not allow you to sort of, 
distance yourself from the, the the images that he's showing to you i mean people have i mean i remember one I mean, a.o scott or somebody in in uh was was basically accusing him of being a nazi because he was kind of forcing people to to, to sort of contemplate this violence and he was asked about this and he was saying well no the real immoral kind of violence is the kind of violence that's consumable that is that is made fun and pleasurable and he you know he mentioned a, a bunch of movies including i think a tarantino mm -hmm. movies that kind of way of, of of kind of hip violence um and he said what he's doing is kind of is is actually uh forcing you to reckon with the real consequences of violence but i i mean i think we have a i i am occasionally i mean i watch as much streaming tv as everybody else and i and i am occasionally kind of struck you know i step back and i realize what am i watching and why is this entertainment why am i why am I kind of immersed yet again in a, a scene of torture or, you know, or a scene like that? And, um, and I, I started to feel, you know, I, I don't, I, I want to be very clear that this isn't, I'm, I, this isn't a kind of conspiratorial thinking and I don't think there's a particular agency behind this, but I, 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 I certainly think that the effect of a kind of, especially a kind of very, a very sort of cynical view of, of, of power and, and the transgressive use of violence by people in power kind of softens us up for, you know, it, 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 we're made to feel naive for believing that people should behave in ethical ways, especially if they are policemen or whatever. I mean, you know, I think, think about the show 24, which sort of normalized in the wake of the, of 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 9-11 really normalized the notion of uh various kinds of extra legal uh i mean torture and other activities like that on the on behalf of the security services and and that sort of i mean that that process of normalization is very interesting to me i mean right now as you say there's a kind of conversation about propaganda and about about uh you know the way that generations of tv police shows have have kind of conditioned a certain sort of expectation about the police but interestingly it's not you know we're not watching dragnet now we're not watching kind of uh you know noble cops you know who are you know thoroughly morally superior what we like to watch is you know from sort of dirty harry onwards is 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 shows about about this sort of seedy transgressive kind of uh yeah, realistic, you know, I mean, very sort of cynical notion of, of, of the operation of, of law and order, but at the same time, we're expected to kind of understand that that is how it has to be. And I think that's a, a very interesting kind of un, under the underlying set of assumptions there. So, I mean, those sort of ideas are floating around and, and, and in, and what I invented was somebody who has, is the showrunner on one of these shows, but also has a kind of, uh, a much more kind of weirdly intellectual side and who is who's sort of drip feeding these these kind of uh, nihilistic messages I mean that that quotation in the passage there the, the narrator turned realizes or I mean, eventually finds out that it's a quotation from an 18th century uh, um, anti-democratic thinker called the Comte de Maistre who's a sort of, who's sort of known in the small circles in which people think about 18th century political theory as, as somebody who was about an implacable enemy of the French Revolution who believed uh, uh, that, you know, power was established by God. And so going against the king and the church was, you know, was just going against God. And, and uh, you know, it was absolutely correct that anybody who rebelled in any way against established power should be destroyed. Um, and and Mestre is a pop, it was a weirdly popular thinker and the kind of uh, in, uh, the sort of intellectual fringes of the far right today. I mean, there are there is a sort of canon of of of, uh, of thinkers who are anti democratic and who are uh, um, in in other ways kind of uh, racist thinkers and so on who are used who are used to sort of flesh out a kind of worldview which is very radically opposed to to sort of mainstream uh social democracy or liberal democracy um so the showrunner is this guy anton who i think it would be fair to describe as the main antagonist yes. of the novel um and he's this sort of like urbane steve bannon style figure 
I think he's more urbane than Steve Mannon. He's a, he's a rather, he's a rather yeah. kind of, uh, he says, no, there's no two, two shirts and kind of yeah, cocaine, he's this guy rattled from complexity. LA, but he's kind of flirting with the far right and posing as an intellectual, but also making a TV show. And when they meet, it's sort of the intellectual part of it that the narrator latches onto and says, mm. you're quoting Schopenhauer in your show must mean something. Um, do you feel like uh, the, the media or people who are reading uh, and discussing the alt-right are giving them too much credibility intellectually? Um, I mean, in some ways too much, some, some ways not enough. I mean, I, I think, I think there, is a, there is, as I say, a kind of complacency about the self-evidence of certain ideas about, about democracy and so on that I, I, I think has led, has led uh, has given space to, to 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 people on the far right to present their ideas as much more credible than they than they are. Um, I mean, there is a sort of, there is a sort of f f fascination with humanizing the far right figure, which I mean, it, it, it's endlessly frustrating to me that you know. I mean, it's just like slightly less than it was a year or two ago, but I mean, they, you know, you can really open the New York Times without seeing some member of the traditionalist workers party being interviewed about his economic anxiety and um so i you know i i i mean i'm just as a matter of intellectual history i'm kind of, i am quite interested in the way that there is a sort of there's a sort of straight line between somebody who is opposed to the french revolution and 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 that that thought can still be about established power and about uh, the use of force and so on can can provide some sort of food for somebody now who wants to argue uh, that certain people shouldn't have rights or that certain people should be excluded from community that uh, you know that uh, uh, for example in America this kind of nativist set of ideas that America is in some way a white country that, uh, that is based on certain sort of Protestantism and then everybody uh, needs to assent to that in order to belong, which is, you know, clearly a very, uh, a set of thoughts that run counter to another, you know, very powerful interpretation of American history, which represent, you know, which rests on the idea of immigrants and becoming American and openness and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's a tradition which I benefited yeah. from and, you know, hold, hold to. I kind of got the sense that uh, Anton may have ripped these quotes from 4chan and might not be able to have a conversation about Schopenhauer if you try to actually engage him the way the narrator does. Like it's sort of this set dressing for the nasty prejudice of what he says in, when they go to the kebab shop together, which is just, you know, I want the freedom to live in a country where I don't have to eat a kebab. Mm. Um, and it, it doesn't, it seems, I wondered if he's sort of playing with this intellectual persona to give it more credibility than it really has. I mean, I, I think there's, there's something to that. I mean, there's certainly a lot of posturing around this figure of the sort of outsider intellectual who's, you know, the mainstream, you know, who's going against the mainstream and who's the only, the only person to see the truth. I mean, there's a long history behind that particular pose the individual against the mass the kind of you know the prophet without honor and 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 it's a it's a it's an easy pose for young disaffected men to take you know it, it can it can have very sort of uh uh unproblematic kind of versions you know this i mean everybody everybody has been cornered at a party by a young dude who wants to to talk to you about how david foster wallace understood the world in a way that you know other people don't uh you know and that kind of you know the sort of mantle of the of the sort of outsider intellectual kind of is worn in that way but when it gets wrapped up with you know what you actually want to talk about is race and iq and you want to talk about um uh, 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 about the, the the soul of nation, or I don't know, whatever, whatever. This is a whole set of intersecting ideas that float around. But there's there's the sort of pose, as you say, of 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 intellectualism and of superiority. I mean, that's I think that's very important. The sort of bohemian superiority to the mass, to the herd. You know, there's a there's a lot of um, 
you know, a lot of very dismissive talk about normies and the MSM and all these kind of terms, which are sort of supposed to indicate that people who are sent to certain ideas are just essentially a herd and that, that the, 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 you know, the individual is, uh, um, you know, the, 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 tr the, the radical thinker kind of goes against that and that the radical thinker is somebody who assents to their set of ideas. I mean, I don't know. The, I mean, I, I was very pleased with the, the book, the, the cover they put on this book. I mean, often I kind of don't like book covers, but this, um, I mean, it, here, I mean, people may well recognize this is the, the Caspar David Friedrich uh, painting of the traveler above the sea of fog, which, I mean, I certainly first came across and, and uh, on a cover of a, a sort of penguin Nietzsche edition and that sort of that, <laughs> that, uh, that character, you know, this individual standing over the world and you know, apart from the world is absolutely part of the self image of a lot of these r extreme right wingers. I mean, they you know, they all have their, their avies of, of Greek philosophers and, and crusader knights and, and all the, I mean, but, in, but also this kind of German idealist, uh, romantic figure. And, uh, um, that you know, and the whole book is in dialogue with that. You know, the the narrator is, is somebody who's obsessed with German poetry and wants to feel himself that person. In you know, mm. so it's a, it's a, it's 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 a kind of pose that that is available to all sorts of different uh, the, the kinds of people. The emotional range between Heinrich von Kleist and Anton it's not a huge one, right? If these are your two models, someone who wants to kill himself and is, <laughs> <laughs> um, challenging Goethe to a duel. And then uh, the showrunner of Blue Lives, it's, it's like, that's one range of human experience, mm. very specific, very different, but not, there's a lot outside that. Uh, um, I mean, yeah. So I wanted to ask you, because this has led you into all these intellectual currents and some very dark places on the internet, uh, what the research was like for this book. It sounds like it was sort of organic and a very, like maybe a decades long, uh, kind of culmination um yeah i mean i you know I, I i first got online i got online fairly early on i suppose i mean i i had i think i had my first internet connection in 1992 which was sort of very i mean the, the web was just about beginning but already then i mean i realized that it was a place where you could you suddenly had a a, a window on or a connection to all sorts of subcultures that were that were not uh, you know visible before and so i have always spent a lot of time kind of digging around in 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 odd corners of of the net and and partly because you know because i you know i i am uh, you know i'm somebody who's is interested in in uh avant-garde and and various kind of countercultural sorts of thought i keep i kind of run and you know various points i've kind of run into milieus where i'm kind of you know, pretty interested in what they're all talking about and suddenly i realize oh yeah no you're all fascists oh i see right okay here we are and um so i mean that's just real but realizing i mean through i spent a lot of time on the on 4chan and places like that about kind of 10 15 years ago like before it got as i mean it was already quite dark i have to say but before it got uh, before it got very politically connected or politically kind of instrumentalized um and sort of watching watching the kind of i mean an important thing i found there was watching watching irony become literal becoming a pose of of sort of shocking uh you know to sort of you know let's shock let's shock the normies by pretending to to be into general pinochet becoming oh no maybe we actually should throw the leftists out of helicopters and 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 that's and also watching the kind of that those some of those ideas penetrate the mainstream i mean if you if you have done you know if you're familiar with these media then it becomes obvious when people are in kind of positions of high political power like stephen miller he's clearly somebody who's reading the same stuff I've been reading and and when you realize well that's actually that's the unspoken part of his uh of his political kind of uh territory um you know there's a lot there's a lot of talk about hiding your power level amongst uh, amongst these far right communities which is you know which is a which is a way of saying 
of, of uh, saying that you, you, you disguise the extreme nature of your views until you're sure of whoever you're talking to. I mean, I, I mean, I would say that Miller and various other people in the kind of orbit of the current administration are hiding their power level. I think there's a lot, there's a, there's a hinterland of extremism that even with all we've seen is not actually out in the open. Right. And, and so there's this difference in going into it and looking sort of anthropologically or trying to identify which ideas are in play and someone like Stephen Miller is visiting and seeing like, this is the base of support that I can enjoy. This is a sort of proving ground for ideas that could be viable for someone like me. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, Miller. I mean, Miller is Miller is is somebody who's made it into into the the White House. But there are he's in, in many ways he's very sort of seems very psychologically typical of of, of people that you find in in these uh, online communities. Was there anything specifically for the character and for the for the book? that you that made you like go back to those communities uh and, and try and look at them in a slightly different way um well i mean i uh, i'm trying to think i think of a of a, a sort of concrete I example i mean it was you know a book a book is a kind of as a big bucket really that you get your 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 you know, you're making it a novel over a period of several years and it has to be, or it inevitably does become a kind of repository for all sorts of feelings and, and experiences that you have while you write it. And, uh, and my experience during the period of, of writing it was that of this kind of marginal set of people that I had been anthropologically interested in and said, Oh, look, you're all interested in pretending there's a, somewhere under the south pole that the not you know that not a nazi expedition we went to see in the 30s for re watching that come sort of towards something you know on a train track with something coming towards you like this this community which seemed very marginal suddenly seemed to be instrumental in in rallying support around a, a political candidate and then is now part of our mainstream discourse in a way that it absolutely wasn't you know eight ten years ago um and so that was that was the revisiting it. It was revisiting it and realizing that a kind of cozy anthropological, oh, aren't they quaint kind of position was just not adequate. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think now I'm going to move to the questions from the audience. Um, so we have a few minutes left. Um, so first question, I'm just going to ask two. Uh, the first one is, do you think a lot of people watching violent shows like the one in your book have guilt later that they should have done something despite it being fictional? Um, I, th I think there is a, there, I mean, it's, I, th I think, you know, there's a sort of cumulative sense. I mean, some, watching a lot of violence wears you down. And I think we also you know we're, we're used to you know in our feeds social media feeds we see things that people would not have seen and we can replay them as well i mean I, I'm, I'm i've actually just been reading a book for something else about uh, about the Viet vietnam in the in the early late 50s and early 60s before the war broke out and the, of monks setting themselves on fire and that very, very famous image of the of of the of the burning monk was was you know that was a picture that was taken as a, as a by one journalist and and people would have seen that on a TV new, TV news or in a, a still image in a newspaper but they wouldn't have been in a position to just replay that again and again and again and that that gives us a very different relationship to images of violence and also they come on us by surprise you know I mean these images of police shootings that get circulated often people don't want to see those and people are becoming more sophisticated now about not sharing them, about being able to kind of protest them without necessarily reproducing that. Uh, you know, and there, I mean, there's also kind of, there's an interesting and I think quite complicated conversation about the language of harm and, and hurt and violence around words and images that, uh, that, you know, people are trying to kind of understand the ways in which, uh, uh, culture is, you know, is or isn't violent. And there's a, you know, there's a, I mean, it's a, it's a big area maybe to get into with only a few minutes left, but I, I, I think we're, 
you know, we are reassessing how we experience images of violence. Uh, next question is from Hermione Hobie. She hi, says, Hermione. Hi. <laughs> she says, <laughs> hi, Harry. Uh, you mentioned surveillance and being watched. This made me think it too about being seen, less in the idiomatic sense of being understood, but rather in terms of spectacle, both the individual spectacle uh, of, for example, toppling, sorry, I just missed, I have to read that again. Both the individual spectacle via social media, what we curate, project, perform to assuage our consciences, and the public spectacle of, for example, toppling Confederate statues. Um, as a novelist, you must believe in symbolism, but I'm curious how you feel political symbolism is working right now in this moment of reckoning, which seems so urgently to call for radical policy change rather than just cosmetic refurbishment. Is there a place for symbolism too? That, I mean, that's another big question, Armani. It's, um, I mean, I, I think, I think you know, one, one in, important thing in this is 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 the is the sort of sleight of hand substitution of symbolism for real material change you know i mean the uh the sort of uh the 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 joke about you know on i mean an internet joke which i i quoted in a piece i wrote for the new York review recently um you know uh black people stop killing us liberals great we've renamed the pentagon the maya angelou war center um, and so that kind of that, you know, the idea that by taking out a Super Bowl advert saying Black Lives Matter, that I don't know, an insurance company <coughs> is is going to is going to affect change is 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 kind of is very bankrupt. But at the same time, if you're thinking about statues and veneration and commemoration, the importance of of, of toppling Confederate statues, and I do believe that you know, those, I mean, they are like is like kind of going around a small German town and seeing Nazi war memorials. It's kind of extraordinary to me that these things are there. Um, they are, you know, historical memory doesn't demand that the, that a Confederate soldier be in front of your courthouse or in front of the main or in the main square of your town. I mean, that, that is a highly symbolically charged position uh, for, for that image to have take that statute stick it in a museum you know stick, you know contextualize it in a different way do not say that when you're going to get justice in charlottesville or wherever you are uh that you have to pass by this image of the of, of the lost cause so that and that's the sense in which symbolism is important and has is it you know, has what i was would think of as kind of a material basis to it um well i guess this links to the final question uh this is from someone called alex clark do you think we'll ever have a reckoning with American fascism so long as we call it fascism with the baggage that entails? Do we need a new name for what's happening in, happening in American politics so that we can address it effectively? I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, I, uh, it's, 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 it's very, very difficult, isn't it? Because I mean, as soon as you, as soon as you say the word fascism, there's 10 people there, you know, pointing out all the ways in which the, the current politics are are different from mid-century Italy and, and and Germany. I mean, I mean, I don't I don't mind what it gets called as long as it goes. Um, and you know, I, I mean, I find nativism quite a kind of good, you know, indigenous historical frame to understand as the sort of politics that are around Trump. I mean, I think it amounts to the same thing in a lot of ways. Um, and I, you know, I think you can get it. You can. But there is a cla there is a clarity that comes with with calling what we're looking at I mean, at least incipient fascism. I mean, I certainly we're at a moment where there is an a, attempt at putting together an auto autocracy in this country, and and it's a, it's it's extremely serious. And uh, and I you know I personally have no problem with with. Uh, you know, using fascism, but it's just, it's just a kind of tactical question. I mean, maybe, you know, autocracy or uh, American nativism or, you know, are, 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 are frames which people will find more congenial and won't get everybody mired up in, you know, literally Hitler, you know, internet conversations. <laughs> um, well, I thought these are, these are huge questions to ask uh, about a novel, but this is maybe what happens when you write a very political novel. Um, I found this novel incredibly useful to think with about this moment in the last several decades. So thank you so much for talking to us.
about it. Well, thank you for inviting me to, to do that. And thanks everybody for, um, for turning up. Um, so that's all we have time for. Thank you to Hari Kunzru. Um, uh, Red Pill is out this week. It's just come out. Um, so I recommend that you check it out and stay tuned for more of these events from the New Republic. Good night.